tina koto tina tato kiti fari e tuna tina kwe kiti mana finua tina koto tina te mihi i runga i te kopapa o te ra ko te national digital forum um, ko no ki pukeriki library ko angela jawat taku ingua tina koto tina koto tina koto katoa kia ora everyone Thank you very much for coming to our presentation today. Um, my name's Angela Jowett, and as Caleb said, I'm the Collections and Digital Coordinator at Pukeriki Library, and this is Scott Burgess, our digital librarian. We've been um, running some virtual reality experiences in the library, so today's session we're just going to tell you about what we've done, the technology we've used, the results of some surveying that we did, and um, what we've been doing since. And we've also brought along some technology with us, so you're quite welcome to have a go with our Oculus Quest at the end if you'd like to try them out. Um, Pukiarihi is part of a museum, library and eyesight complex, and we're part of the New Plymouth District Council. Um, what we're just gonna, we're just gonna show you a quick clip now. And I'll explain what this is. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Scott, I'm Digital Librarian at Pukeriki. Um I'm basically the guy who turns things off and on for everyone at the library. Um, that's my main role, but um, I get to play with all the tech and the technology there. So um, those are some short clips of um, some experiences we did for Tech Week. So I'm sort of just going to go through our journey with VR over the last year. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, Funnily enough, last year I'd never done any VR, never put a headset on or anything like that. And um, I came to NDF last year and was lucky enough to hang out with the Wellington crew at the library. And I was really, really lucky that they were actually testing out VR gear at the time. So I got to have a little play. And I must admit, at the time I thought, oh, it's amazing, but it's not something we'll ever get for our library or maybe not just yet, just for budget reasons, things like that. Um, I went back and basically what happened, this is kind of a timeline of our journey with VR. What happened was, um, as you do, I was in Kmart and I saw the first one you see there, which is a uh, $15 special. Um, it's basically these first two headsets here are ones where you just put your smartphone in it. They're quite basic, but you know, cheap and cheerful. If you've got a smartphone, you're often running with VR. Um, the next two, the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest, they're actually standalone headsets. So you don't actually require any additional equipment. It's all built into one. Um, that's the Oculus Quest there. And then finally is the HTC Vive Pro, which is a PC-based VR headset. Um, they're sort of top of the line at the moment. You've got to have a pretty grunty PC with a graphics card running them and that kind of thing. And as you can see from the price, a little bit expensive. So um, yeah, that's, so that's kind of the equipment there and the styles you get. Um, like I said, I brought a Kmart special. Um, it was underwhelming. It was, it was all right, it did what it did. Um, basically, a little bit after that, one of our colleagues actually had the Samsung gear, 
and we tried that out and it's a little bit of an improvement, a little bit better. Um, we actually took it out, we go out to the community libraries uh, in the school holidays and do events, take out technology for the children and uh, the community groups to use and we took out the Samsung gear and it was um, pretty obvious straight away it was a bit of a hit, everyone loved it. Um, they would queue up just to keep on having another go, kids, older people, adults, that kind of thing, they really, really enjoyed it. Um, so. We basically had those two headsets. At this stage, um, we kind of had the bonus of being connected to a museum. Our museum was doing an exhibition and they were going to show what the future of museum exhibitions could possibly be. And they wanted to have um, some VR headsets. So um, as the resident VR expert, not that I was, they came to me and said basically, can you figure out what we need for the exhibition and test it and set it up for us? Um, the bonus was they were going to have backup gear which meant they'd have one in their museum running all the time and we at the library would have the extra set. So um, it's quite good. You can actually, just for people who don't know, you can hire all the um, equipment. So there are companies out there where you can hire the equipment, test it out, see what it's like, see if it's fit for what you want to do. So um, we hired some gear. Um, we went for the higher end stuff, which is the PC based stuff tested it out and um, yeah we decided to go with the HTC Vive Pro which is still possibly yeah it's it's top of the line sort of stuff um, new equipment's coming out all the time but that's what we went with we decided we'd get for the museum and by default we'd pick up at the library which is quite cool um, just as another sideline yeah after we got that we did get the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest so we actually have quite a bit of VR gear at the library but um, yeah so on um, just for people who don't know, um, there's various platforms for downloading apps and the experiences for the VR headsets. Um, there's Steam, there's Oculus, there's whatever. The main one we went with, um, just because it was cheap and cheerful, was Viveport and we went with the Infinity package, which is an annual subscription. So it gives you access to over 700 different titles. It means you don't have to go out and purchase each one as you go along, so it gave us sort of quite a good bang for our buck. So we went with that. Um, so we had this equipment at the library and we sort of wanted to do something with it, get it out, get the community using it. Um, at the same time, it was Tech Week was coming up. So we applied to be one of the headline events and obviously we thought it would be a really good platform to sort of launch what we had at the library, get, get some publicity, get people aware of what we had and obviously get people in and use the technology. So um, they accepted us and we became one of the highlight events. Um, Sort of once that sort of came through, we sort of had to decide on what we were going to do as experiences. Um, those video clips we saw earlier were basically these three here. Um, the big thing, if you use VR a lot, if you're getting people in to have a quick go sort of thing, you kind of need experiences that are quite intuitive, that don't need a lot of sort of learning time for people to pick up. Um, there's nothing worse if you've got a 10 minute slot, you know, you spend five minutes of that actually getting the hang of it. So um, these are the ones we went through. I spent many, many hours testing, or playing as some would say, um, with the VR headsets. Um, we decided on these. We went with, first of all, went with Dreams of Dali. It's a Salvador Dali painting, um, which obviously you can move through in VR, but it has a really, really good intuitive kind of way of moving through the um, experience. You don't have to use the controllers, which some people find quite confusing. It's actually where you point your head and you move through. Um, the other one we went with was Singularity. Uh, it's how to describe it, I don't know. You're in space and playing with particles and it's almost like you can create gravity um, and you can spin the colours around. But once again, it's a real intuitive, quite an easy one to pick up for people. They can be in there 30 seconds later, they know how to do it and they're, they're having a whale of a time. And speaking of whales, um, the blue. Uh, anyone who's had anything to do with VR probably knows about the blue. It's a bit of a show pony, but it's, uh, it's an awesome experience. You basically are underwater, 80 foot whale swims past and that kind of thing. There's also another one we went with, which is the reef experience, which same again, you're underwater, but it gives people that thing where they're on a reef, they can see the turtles, jellyfish, that kind of thing, and interact with them. So those are the three we went with. Um, so we had our experiences, we had our equipment. Um, next, we had to actually have somewhere to put it. Um, we're not blessed with space at Pukiriki, but we did have one spare room where they were stashing chairs. Um, so that was up on the first floor. So we decided we'd do a little bit of work, had a little bit of budget, and we kind of converted it into what we call our tech lab slash VR lab. So we gave it a lick of paint, um, put up some curtains, sort of jazzed it up a little bit, put some uh, wrap on the windows, that kind of thing. Um, we also went with a swivel chair as well there and hung the cabling across the roof. One of the things with VR is, 
with some of the systems, you are attached by cable, and it can be quite distracting for people. So we went a little system up on the roof there as well. Um, so yeah, that's 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 our little VR lab there. Um, so we this is basically what the process we went through with um, for Tech Week as such when we ran it. Um, we had bookings. Uh, we didn't really want to go along the lines of having a queue of people outside. Otherwise, you know, as everyone's having, you have a queue of 15, 20 people sort of thing. So we had an online booking system. Uh, we went with 15 minute slots. That just gave us time to get people prepped, get them in there, get the headset on them, um, give them 10 minutes of experience, and then, you know, obviously then take them out. Um, we were doing two two hour sessions per day. Um, and we just obviously, because it was tech week, we went for the week. Um, staffing. Um, we had two staff at all times for those sessions. We had a host out front who would go through just health and safety guidelines with people, um, sort of run through the experiences so they were kind of aware of what they were coming into and what to expect. Sort of got them prepped so it made it a bit easier once they're in the room. Um, we also had the host at the end of the experience um, do an interview with the people, just get some information and statistics and things about what they found with the experience and what they liked. And then inside the room we had a technical person, e.g. the guy who turned the PC on and off it or needed it. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, also, I'd, I'd say, having done it quite a few times now, I'd call them a guide, because when people come in, if they haven't used it before, you really need to know how it works and guide them through it so they can get the most of the experience. So it's a big part of it. And also say, you know, the important things like, turn left, you'll see the whale. Um, we had uh, a set of rules and safety guidelines. Um, we had a big sheet, obviously, to show them all the standard stuff. Um, we went for people five years or older, and we, like I said, we had the seat in there. Um, it doesn't take long on YouTube to see VR fails left, right, and center where people fall over. So we wanted to open it up to as many people in the community as we could, so we thought if we had a seat in there, it gave older people, people with disabilities, that kind of thing, an option to actually be seated as well. Um, as we went along, with some people, we move the seat out because then you know, they get more of an experience, that ability to move around the room and things as well. So um, that's why we went with that. Oh, and now it's Angela. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to run you through now um, some of the results that we had from the surveying. Scott mentioned we were doing some surveys at the end when our customers came out. So we had. We had uh, 112 slots throughout the week during our um, times that you could book within. And as you can see, we got 102 survey results. So that was a pretty good return rate and response rate for us. Um, quite an even split between male and female who came along to have a go. This is uh, the age ranges of the people. So a lot of children and under 15. But then also a good group through the middle between the ages of 25 and 54. When we asked whether they had used virtual reality before, we had slightly more that hadn't, so that was really interesting for us to see what their reaction was going to be. And these were the virtual reality experiences that they chose. So the blue, which Scott mentioned was the show pony, was definitely the one that most people chose first up. But we were lucky as well that in the 10 minutes, um, quite a lot of the people had a chance to try more than one of our experiences. And this is what they said when we asked them to describe how they felt. So, so um, the top one was obviously they were amazed. They were excited, happy, they thought it was realistic, it was fun, and they said it was cool. So those were the top words. When we asked what they enjoyed most about their experience, a lot of people, about 26 of the people, percent of the people mentioned the blue as they would do. But after that, it was things around it being a new experience, it, it taking them somewhere else, it being realistic, the interaction of it, and the immersion. So those were the things they liked about it the most. So I've just got some quotes here for you from our survey. So in terms of new experiences, taking people to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do in their life. So we thought that was pretty cool being somewhere else, so escapism. There were a lot of comments actually about escapism. Escapism from real life and everyday life as well. Realistic feelings, so feeling the way they felt and how it surrounded you and how you really felt like you were there. 
and with interaction, how they got to interact with the different things in the environment. Um, in the blue, you could reach down and, and touch some of the anemones and things like that that were on the reef. You could reach out and play with the fish that were going past. And I think you might have seen in the first video at the beginning, a uh, big jellyfish swimming past. You could reach out and touch that and get a little bit of a haptic experience as well. Um, what else? That was really the only things you can interact with. I guess uh, some of the kids who were playing with the singularity and being able to throw things around in particles, they really enjoyed that. With the immersion, it being 3D and being immersed inside. So there were some comments from some of our customers because we had a screen set up plugged in as well so that um, parents or whoever were in the room could see maybe what their children were watching. And when they got inside the, the mask, then they said, whoa, this is a whole different experience than watching it in 2D on a screen. Is there anything you disliked, we asked, and no was the resounding answer to that one. Uh, we only had sort of like one or two comments that were talking about VR making them feel a little bit disorientated, maybe bringing out some phobias, some fears, depending on what, like heights, you know, in um, Salvador Dali one, you go up quite high in some of the towers, so they were mentioning that, and some people were asking for more haptic experiences, so being able, like wind or the, a moving chair or really being able to feel things, so those were the sorts of things they were mentioning. So these are the top three benefits that the people in our survey came out with. Things about it being able to provide realis realistic experiences um, for education purposes and also going where you can't physically go. So escaping to worlds or having experiences you wouldn't normally be able to have. So thinking around um, if you weren't able to travel maybe to the other side of the world, but you were able to have that experience. And I don't know how many people were in the room for the previous <laughs> experience, but there were some, a previous presentation, sorry, there was some things mentioned about recreating things from the past and history so that you could experience them now even though they weren't there. This is through VR. Education, so definitely this we thought was a good one about being able to play with things in a safe way and Scott and I actually visited First Gas and had a look at their VR experience which was training in how to vent the pipes and safely do that and learn how to do that before you went out there onto the job in real life. Preparing children or I guess adults as well for um, procedures and things such as x-rays. So this was around overcoming your phobias and your fears and I guess you could use it if fear of spiders, fear of heights, that sort of thing. A safe way to do that. And going where you can't physically go. So this was a really good one around people with disabilities or the elderly and we've got um, example coming up at the end of where we've gone with this since this tech week and how we've been able to demonstrate that. So any drawbacks, I mean 25% of the people said that there were no drawbacks. I was really surprised that nobody came out with it ruining their eyesight at all in our survey. Um, the pretense of reality, so it was interesting to hear people talking about people becoming disconnected and forgetting to go out into nature and the natural world and I guess this is connections around you know, your mental health and that sort of thing. Um, that it could be addictive and we find that. You get the mask on, next thing you know, how many hours later and you're still playing with something. You know, people seem to really enjoy it. And a couple of mentions, 12% of people were talking about the cost and the expense of the equipment. Mind you, that is all coming down in price now and becoming more affordable. So just because we were being we were being us and we don't have a lot of other things like a um, like a makerspace area or a lab or anything like that at the moment, we thought we'd chuck the question in there to ask, what else? What other technologies? And I left it in here because I thought you may be interested to know that um, a lot of people for us are asking around 3D printing. And then the second most common thing would be if you combined the 3D design and multimedia sort of PCs into a lab to allow people to create. That would be the next thing. Robotics and coding, video recording, photography lab, music suite and laser cutting in that order were the things that people were interested in. And so what's the potential? What's the potential for virtual reality? And this is what our people mentioned around um, outreach. I thought it was really interesting that some of the local comments came out around being able to take people to the top of Mount Taranaki without them having to walk there. Um, the Festival of the Lights through Pukekura Park in New Plymouth, which is quite a famous sort of event, being able to take people through there without them actually visiting. 
exploring other countries and space and cultures is sort of a given in historical architectural things. Preservation, which I think some people are already playing with, preservation of um, museum exhibitions and that sort of thing, and actually we've done our first one of that in the museum just recently. And virtual reality books, which I hadn't even thought of, but as a librarian that, that idea really was interesting to me about how people, and it wasn't just one person, it was several people were mentioning being able to go in and experience a book from the inside. And there's our overall rating, so people pretty much loved it. 80, 88, yep, 88% rating it a 5 out of 5, and another 12% at 4. So since Tech Week, here comes Scott. <laughs> All right, um, at this stage, I have pretty much drunk the VR Kool-Aid. I love it. I, I'm not a gamer, I'm not into the gaming side of things, but the educational side of things and the learning possibilities of it, it won't replace anything, but it complements stuff, and I think it's um, really, really powerful. So anyway, I got excited. Um, we currently have the VR Lab open on a weekly basis for people to come in and just have a play. Um, like I said, we've got the Infinity package, so there's a bunch of stuff they can do. But um, I kind of got excited with the other side of things, you know, different groups and different community groups we could deal with as well. Um, one of the first people, I've got a friend and his uh, daughter is a trainee doctor and there's some really, really, really cool um, virtual reality uh, surgery experiences. So I th couldn't think of anyone better to have a try. Um, and so she had a try and she said it was awesome, it was really, really good. Just gives that whole different aspect to learning rather than just a 2D image. Um, some of the experiences are the human body and you can actually expand the human body up to 60 foot tall and take each part off and it will tell you exactly how they connect and all the vessels and things like that. So um, yeah, I got to try it and yeah, she was blown away. She thought it was really, really cool. Oh, three minutes, yeah, okay. Um, we had a deaf group come in, they were doing some uh, basic computer training with us and we got them up there and got them in the VR as well. And same again, it, you never fail to get a, you know, a good response from people when they try it for the first time. Um, they really enjoyed it. Um, like I say, at the bottom there, one lady was signing away, just expressing the whale as it swam past and how impressive it was. So um, they were really keen on it as well. Um, this is Phil, uh, he's a local uh, Taranaki legend, I suppose, in a way. Um, but he had a neck injury when he was 15. Um, he has quite limited mobility, even in his hands. Um, but we wanted to see just the possibilities of it as well. So we brought him in and um, got him in there. It, there was a bit of manoeuvring around, but we could make it work as well, which was just shows the possibility of like that thing for people with physical, physical disabilities to be able to actually take them places. Um, we took him up to, in Google Earth, you can move around and things like that. So we took him up to the top of Mount Taranaki, and he hadn't been up there since he was like a young kid sort of thing. So that was really cool. Um, we have a group that comes in once a week, Migrant Woman, and um, we thought it'd be really good experience as well, just to do the same with Google Earth, for them to just be able to show, we had it up on a big screen and they could go into Google Earth and go back to their, where they'd come from originally. Uh, one of the ladies actually lived on the edge of the Patagonian uh, National Park and so she got to show everyone around there as well. And um, I think a big thing as well is actually creating content, it's kind of got a cool thing that we want to start looking at. Um, New Zealand Geographic came down and we were flying a drone over Mount Taranaki the other day and they were taking 8K footage. Normally when you look at video footage, 4K, that kind of thing, it can be a little bit grainy and not actually that crisp, not like the computer generated stuff. That is, is crisp as, it's awesome. It just shows what will come in the future as prices come down once they, you know, there's more filming like that, that the footage is really, really impressive. So. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to more of that stuff coming out as well, just so we can show, you know, local content to people. Um, this is Northern Health School. Uh, we do an outreach program. Uh, we just started and we went out there and we we're taking out technology, robots and that. We thought we'd take out the VR headsets. Um, we went out there and we thought, okay, we'll try the VR headsets and see what happened. When we went out there, they're really, really quite quiet. We didn't know what to expect, but they're quite quiet. And um, we put them in the headsets and they all of a sudden started livening up. Um, it was almost, I'm making an assessment, it was that the fact that they're in the VR and doing the same experience at the same time, they could actually interact with each other a lot better. So um, here's a short clip. Very short. Yeah. Can you help, please? It's like right in my face. I think the thing to explain there is when that happened, we were talking to the teacher later, she had said that they'd been in the same classroom for over a year and had never talked to each other. And then when they put on the VR, they were laughing, smiling, and, and interacting with each other. She, uh, that girl, Chloe, didn't actually even know the other boy's name. So it's just, just one of those little things that, that VR can do 
Um, I think it's still quite new technology, but it's fun just trying different things and seeing what we can do with the different community groups. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Chloe, Chloe um, has actually come into the library. Um, so, yeah, she's come in and tried the VR and so forth as well. So it's really cool. I'm just here to wrap it up now, so thank you very much. If you're interested in contacting us at all for any further information, these are our contact details here. Um, I've been coming to NDU for a few years and I've been following virtual reality presentations and I think that we are really starting to see some benefits um, in this technology and what can be done with it. The technology itself is coming down in cost, like these quests that we've got over here, they're about $700 for a set, but that is like having the big full HTC, it's got the sensors all built in and the hand controllers, so it's coming down in price, making it more available, I guess, just for the normal people. And um, more experience of becoming available online and more technology is out there for us to be able to create our own content. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>